You know, Tim, I really thought this show was going to be kind of focus on, ah, let's, we missed last Wednesday, so we'll have this Wednesday to react to that Tommy Reese news and probably talk about a, um, a rather, I don't want to say boring, but, you know, Andy Ludwig hire. That's what I thought we were going to talk about. But no. Yeah, Harry Heastan retiring. It's like, you know, light night, hey, light night. I don't even think we're going to get to talk about Reese in this show. I mean, we'll have some overlap, I'm sure. But I don't even know if we're going to get to talk about Harry. Like, it's that's like our last topic. We have so much to talk about. What a crazy past, what, five days or so from the time that um, Andy Ludwig got to Notre Dame's campus last, I think it was Friday, um, to now he's – Staying at Utah and Notre Dame has its offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, two different people for those roles. So uh, absolutely crazy uh, few days. And we're here to talk about it all uh, with Tim Hyde and joining us in a few minutes will be um, the legend, Chris Zorch, a friend of the program here at blue and gold. He really needs no introduction, but of course, um, legendary Notre Dame defense lineman uh, played a long time in the NFL with the bears and college football hall of famer. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the handsomest guys you'll see on here, you got Tim Hyde, Chris Zorich. I need to step my game up personally, but, um, Tim, how how you doing, man? Just, we're, we're going to really dive into it, but your thoughts these past few days, man, been a little crazy for you. Well, I mean, I just want to know, you know, I just want to make sure Andy Ludwig got some really good photos at the hockey game. So those going to be some lifelong memories there. But, uh, oh, I can't wait to talk about this hockey game. Who organized that? But, uh, <laughs> ooh. Uh, no, it's been, it's been, I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, you were out skiing, chopping wood in Colorado, you know, wearing the flannels, enjoying life with the woodsmen in Breckenridge and I haven't seen you in two weeks and it feels like two years. It's like, what in the world just happened? I mean, it's Notre Dame. It's like, here we are talking about, oh, no staff changes. You and I haven't even talked about Reese, you know, no. you know, together and boom, that, you know, he goes to the evil empire down South and. Yeah, you know, and the vitriol towards him. Holy moly. It's like, geez Louise. But um, yeah, the la- this last weekend's been wild. Um, I'm so glad, you know, I, I I did a little Marine Corps discipline on Monday night when the news broke about the buyout. I said, Tim, do not go on the message board. And I did not, Mike. I stayed off that thing until the next morning. Woo! You had posted something. There was already like 15 pages on it. So I just sat back, read them and enjoyed it. And it's been a whirlwind. It's been a whirlwind. I look forward to getting Chris aboard, giving his perspective as the alum, someone who's worked with Jack Swarbrick as well, I believe, at Notre Dame during his time there. So it is wild. It's yeah. wild. Let's get our, to it. Our message board um, at Blue and Gold, I want to pop it on the screen for a second. It's been absolutely popping. I, um, I told you, Mike, you should you should have charged for some of those posts. It's like, hey, if you want to post more than five in a thread, it's going to cost you. And guys would pay it. I mean, it's, it's, it's been nonstop. Uh, Schwarbeck should resign. We have a thread on that. Two new aces in, in the NLB. Um, yeah, I got it, – it's been, you know, people talking about entering the uh, transfer portal as a fan. The Blue and Gold.com <laughs> message board has been um, pretty it, bonkers. Tim, I want to pop this up. This I just found this pretty funny. Um, from Patrick Angle, just tweeted at this a couple moments ago. It turns out that Notre Dame's next offensive coordinator was in this picture after all. And for for podcast folks, um, it is Andy Ludwig um, in in the center of this picture here for for YouTube. You got Mark Schumann on the right side of the picture, and you got uh, yeah Notre Dame's new offensive coordinator Jared Parker on the left. And um, just there really is so much to unpack here. So. Folks in the live chat with us, drop your questions, drop your super chats. Um, we'll try to get it, uh, get to them. We'll, we'll have Chris Zorch on here in, in just a few moments um, to talk about all this, but really so much to unpack. Like I, I, it's like not a surprise that Notre Dame ended up with Jared Parker as our offensive coordinator. Okay. He was kind of the one in-house candidate when, you know, when news breaks that Reese is going to Alabama and, you know, guys like Patrick Angle and Tyler Hork at blueandgold.com and cover our beat or doing hot board article. Yeah, you throw on Jared Parker on there. You always throw on the internal candidate. But to actually see this happen, again, is a, it's a surprise, but also it's kind of like the most Notre Dame thing to happen. Notre Dame, last couple of offensive coordinators came right from within the program. Uh, and, of course, it's Notre Dame to have the tight ends coach as the offensive coordinator, right? You had it with Chip Long, too. Yeah. Only at Notre Dame. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, Tim, it's 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 going to be exciting. You know, real quick, you know, real quick on the OCs, just going back a few years, you got, I mean, Mike Sanford was hired after Denbrock in 14. Mike Sanford had no OC experience. He was an assistant at Stanford, but he was the hot young guy. They hired him. Then you go Chip Long, who had only been, he's been a tight end coach's career, one season as an OC. Then you got Tommy Reese, who was just a QB coach, an alum, what, 29, 30, when he gets promoted. And then you got Parker, who everyone's like ridiculing or ripping them up or whatever, because they don't know them. That, that, that's the thing. It's, I mean, let's be honest. That's what it is. The dude's got 17 years of coaching experience. Not to be the, you know, the, the hype machine or whatnot, but I'm like, He's got more experience than the last three coordinators that Notre Dame's hired. So, all right. Well, you're talking about 17 years of coaching experience. We got Raceland High School. So, calm down there, Tim. No, yeah. Well, I'm talking about, I think I counted his college, but, but whatnot. But, uh, he's coached, he's coached a long time and he's been with some good programs. He's not some slap who's been around. And I, and when his name came up and people threw it away, I remember going on the message board saying, Hey, there's one thing about coaches, they hire guys they know. And you got to go back. And Marcus Freeman's known him for a decade. Had he done this 10 days ago, people would have been up in arms, fired up and whatnot. But we would be 10 days into the Parker Freeman offensive regime by now. So it is what it is. That's the way I look at it. He's a good ball coach. He's had a good history. He's been around some good people. Dave, spent two years with Dave, David Cutcliffe. How, how many message board posts, Mike, have we heard or uh, messages here on our live? For, oh, how come David Cutcliffe's not hired as an analyst? Well, you got a guy who spent two years with him. So it's like he's going to, they're going to get a little cut cliff in there somehow. But well, uh, Tim, you're on the hot take machine right now because I don't think Notre just, Dame fans are going to enjoy that. Oh, but. Of course they're not because it's, it's, there's Mike, it's Pitchfork Nation. It's like they just want blood, but Notre Dame doesn't have a history of going out and hiring these hot shot offensive coordinators. They don't. So I don't know why everyone thought they were going to get some guy from the NFL and, pay him all this money. I mean, quick, quick 30 seconds on yeah. that is these initial lists. I always thought were ridiculous. I'll be very honest with you. Mac head coaches, like a head coach is going to leave a head coaching job to come to ND. Patrick Angle's mm-hmm. list had Parker and Gould. Do- Gould yes. Gould so I will give him Gould credit Gould. for that, but continue. Hey, well, I posted it. I tagged on Gino Patrick. I remember when that started, I said, put this guy on your list. Just, he's a guy who's coached with Freeman. Go back to those Cincinnati years, right? These are coaches that were at Cincinnati beginning to build it, and they go to the playoffs. Those are good football coaches. So, but, you know, but just going back to that initial list, it's these NFL guys. Why would you take an NFL guy who's going to come to Notre Dame? They're going to – he's going to be right back. This was my old thinking in this whole thing real quick, is who is going to be here in January 2024? Just to be honest, right? Because to me – Goolsby and I have had like 6,000 conversations on this the last week is who is going to be here in January, 2024. Cause they have a rent a quarterback for one year. They do. They have a rent a quarterback. So if you get a guy from the NFL, he's going to get a call because Sam Hartman's a damn good quarterback. He's going to have a good season. Someone's going to call him. Someone's going to call yank the OC away in December. They're gone. So you're right back to this position. Ludwig I thought was an excellent choice because he's just been an OC his entire life. Yeah. So what's the odds of him leaving in December? Very, very slim. So that was my initial take. These Mac coaches, the same thing. They're going to come to Notre Dame and they're gone in December because they're going to get a power five offer. You want to know, you want to know what I love about you, Tim, when you say, I got to say something real quick, 30 seconds. And then you talk for a minute and a half. That's what I love about you. Hey, 90 seconds. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, folks, let's go to, to, to Tim Zorch in just a moment. But before we do, uh, Let's hear from uh, actually not Jared Parker. Uh, we're going to hear from a sponsor in just a moment if I can get that figured out. Uh, a little technical difficulty on my end. Um, but yeah, in just a moment, we are going to hear from our sponsor, Augie's Locker Room, longtime sponsor of Blue and Gold, uh, and uh, a personal favorite of mine. Um, Bet Augie, fantastic man. Okay, yeah, there we go. Folks, if you are a passionate Notre Dame fan and you're looking for that special um piece to complete your rec room and this is all new stuff you know we do this ad read all the time and these items here at the top are new look at this kyle hamilton signed glove look at that i love it folks go to augie locker room they have a wide selection of notre dame stadium pieces jerseys helmets signed gloves um one-of-a-kind rockney items you can find exclusive joe montana signed items and famous sculptor 
Jerry McKenna's miniature replicas of the bronze statues around the stadium. If Augie doesn't have it in his store, he will find it for you. Visit AugiesLockerRoom.com, or if you're in South Bend, stop in at 1811 South Bend Avenue and see the vintage helmet display dating back to 1890. AugiesLockerRoom.com. Give him a call, 574-277-NDND. Love these Shamrock Series cleats game used um, from Jared Patterson signs. Um, used in the 2021 game, uh, Notre Dame beat down Wisconsin. All right, love that. Um, nice. Yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring them in, uh, Chris Zorich. Chris, uh, when I contacted you, I think around 2 a.m. Eastern time last night, I was like, you know what, I'm doing this live show with Tim. I would love someone who has worked on the athletic side of things to talk about this higher it was when i when i reached out to you it was really just let's talk about this buyout thing right, what heck right. happened your take on it now we have the news to talk about uh gino good i'm gonna really get need to get used to this Gadouli. thank you Gadouli. Gadouli. we'll talk about jared parker but i think we do need to start with the ludwig situation and we had a super chat um, that, that ties into this from Andrew. He says, uh, what does not wanting to pay $4 million on buyout say about Notre Dame's commitment to winning? Uh, Pete Sampson confirmed they tried to talk Utah down and left Freeman to flail. I think it's justifiable um, to be upset. So um, do you have uh, m- much of a reaction um, to, to that? Well, I'm sure myself, just like every other ND fan out there, is just really kind of scratching our heads, right? because we're really not sure what actually happened. Um, it's so interesting because we see the vitriol that uh, folks have talked about, about uh, the ND fans out there and those who aren't as excited about what the process is. And having a chance to be an athletic director and someone who's been in that chair where you've had to hire someone, you've had to fire someone. Um, there's a process. And I'm kind of scratching my head because before you start bringing folks on campus, there's a lot of research that has to go into that. Okay. And I, I currently work for a, an executive search firm. Uh, I, I know how to hire and fire folks. Um, you know how to find their compensation, even though some states you can't ask. Um, Utah is a public school, I assume. All that data is public knowledge. So someone didn't do their research? Chris, because... Chris I Googled his buyout before this whole was a thing, and it was, on, okay. it was like in an article from like, right. I mean, it was not hard to figure out. Okay, so so now you can use Google, all right? And so it's not even like you got to go through years of, of uh, state filings to find out exactly how much this guy makes, right? So before something like that happens, I mean, the idea of you being on campus, anybody, is that you're sure this person is going to be the guy or the girl, right? (laughs) Depending on what position you're going to hire for. And so all all that stuff should be done. You should kind of allow this person to come to campus, walk around, see what's going on, Take the, the the proverbial photos at the basketball game or the hockey game as we had a chance to see. And then you can kind of go back and kind of talk about, you know, hey, well, what are the, these are the good schools. Um, these are good neighborhoods, you know. And, and th- those are the conversations you should have when you're on campus, when you're kind of showing the person around. And like I said before, someone didn't do their research. And now you're saying that, I mean, just from the post that you showed, that Notre Dame was trying to talk like Utah, like, I mean, I don't know how valid that is, but in, in that case, if that's what you're trying to do, so now you were aware of it, you, you still brought them on campus, and you're trying to talk someone down from a buyout that is in there for a reason. So, you know, you look at it, and again, you scratch your head and go, guys, what's going on? And, and this is once again, and, and, and I'm a fan boy, obviously, but we are a premier program. We need to start acting like one, right? Because you look at the success that other programs have had around the country hiring folks. Look, look at the way it happened for Tommy Reese at Alabama. 
right? There was rumor happened. Then all of a sudden there was photos of a jet that had a big A on it in South Bay and regional metropolitan uh, airport. And then a couple hours later, Tommy Reese is named the new offensive coordinator in Alabama. Okay, that's how it's done, right? So we were kind of halfway there, right? We, 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 I don't think we had the plane, but we, we kind of had him. We had the guy campus, but we just kind of failed to uh, cross all the T's and, and, and dot the I's. Yeah, Chris, I, I've said this on so many videos, so for folks who always watch our stuff, they're probably tired of hearing me say this, but – Notre Dame having Ludwig at that hockey game, that was calculated, right? They knew that, like Mark Sherman, those guys, they knew that people were going to see Andy Ludwig. I mean, they, they, they're literally having in the public. For me, that was Notre Dame saying, here's our guy, everybody. Right. So there's just still so many questions. And now you have a report from Heather Denich at ESPN, who's been really on top of this for Notre Dame. She's now saying, it wasn't a buyout that Notre Dame was prepared to pay it, but Ludwig had, and look folks for, for you're wondering, like, I'm ready to move on. I get it. We're, we're, we're going to, but this is still a really important conversation to have. Um, but yeah, I, Dennis says, Hey, Notre Dame was going to buy it, but then Ludwig had a change of heart. And it's like, but then you have people talking about the buyout, the truth. You, you just don't know where it is, but either way, it's just, it's just a really strange ordeal um well but at the end of the day all those things are supposed to be taken care of when you start showing him around the campus right and so when you have him at the hockey game kind of laughing and joking oh look look at the score you know all this other stuff like it's a done deal regardless of if there's a buyout issue or not if all that stuff is supposed to be taken care of and he's supposed to be yes you know this is the place i'm going to be in uh the fighting irish Offensive coordinator. I mean, it, that's what's supposed to be happening. That's the reason why you have those photo ops is because you're, you're, you're kind of showing how progressive you are. Now, this is kind of new. I mean, I, I haven't seen a lot of photos in the last maybe five, ten years of people coming by and stuff like that. So, you know, at least we are kind of making that 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 initial step of trying to kind of keep up with, with, with the Joneses. All right, I do want to pop on this tweet because, um, Tim, I know you wanted to talk about this as well, so I'll throw it to you after this. But Tom Mendoza, um, of course, name on the business school. He knows uh, he knows a thing or two about a thing or two. Uh, I'll just read this real quick for podcast audience. And, Tim, you can give your thoughts. We'll throw it over to Chris. It says, many have asked my thoughts. To be clear, I have not been involved, and this is simply my opinion as a fan. In business, when a critical decision um, had resulted in a poor outcome, we first focused on the process. If it was flawed, we fixed it. In this case, it was clearly flawed. Simply put, before anyone is out in a plane or shown as public as the guy, it's almost as if Tom is a fan and heard me say that, a fan <laughs> of our video and heard me say that before um, about you know the hockey game thing. Uh, continuing, Tom says, all facts should be known in the decision agreed upon. Clearly, that was not the case, and the result was a very bad look for all involved on Notre Dame's side. The only thing that will change – um, the only thing that will change is th that is a great hire. After the Eagles' devastating loss, Jalen Hurts and Press Ball by saying you either win or learn. Knowing Marcus, as I do, I'm sure he agrees. The only thing that matters now, um, and sure, this is his focus, is what happens next. And then Tom's tweet after that was, was quote, retweeting what I said. I mean, it must be a big deal. Yes. Kidding. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, Sam, I know, I know you had thoughts on this, so we'll, we'll throw it over to you first. Yeah, real, I mean, it's basically his tweets. You got the guy with the name on the on the building there. It sounds like Chris. I mean, Chris just talked about that right there, the process. Everything that, you know, that, that went into that, knowing the contracts and whatnot. But I, my favorite part of all those tweets is the end. Because I'm thinking of Marcus Freeman. I'm thinking of the coach and moving on. And I also – I posted this this morning on our message board. Someone was saying, well, what's Marcus Freeman doing? I instantly remembered Pete Thamel's story he did before the Buckeyes game. I posted that on the message board in, in Todd Burlidge's article about uh, Marcus's dad when he got hired. Marcus Freeman grew up in a military family. So Marcus Freeman is marching forward. He's not crying over spilt milk. He's not whining or anything. He's, he's marching forward. He's moving. So what's the next thing I got to do? Let's go do it. And that was the first thing I thought about uh, with Mendoza's tweets was, was Freeman and, and, and moving forward. And just real quick on this, you know, on the, you know, on the, you know, on the Lud on the Ludwig real, thing. Real is, quick. Real, real quick. Real quick but, <laughs> you know, we could talk, you know, you know, we could talk about the buyouts and all that stuff, but people constantly 
pass over that Ludwig told Notre Dame no. So he's back in Salt Lake City for 36 hours, hanging out with family on Super Bowl and whatnot. Who's to say when all these negotiations were going on, he just says, I've been here. I'm a West Coast guy. I'm born in Utah. This is where I'm from. At the end of the day, he chose not to. He probably heard about the contract and the, and the hassle, and he was like, oh, to hell with that. I'll just stay here in, in Salt Lake. And that's what start. If you go on some of the Utah papers and their message boards, they've been saying this all along, that Utah's not going to let them go. They're, they're going to keep them. And sure enough, they did. Chris, do you have any well, thoughts on that before we move on to some some current stuff? Sure. I'm just kind of talking about what, what Sim was talking about. If, I mean, we're supposed to be that premier program. How do we start losing people to Utah and Kansas State and all these other – I mean, we're supposed to be up there on the top with the Alabamas, with the Georgias, with the Ohio States. I mean, the teams that are constantly in the hunt – for a national championship, that's where we're supposed to be. And so my feeling is you go out and get the best guy you want, which kind of also talks about like uh, athletic director 101, which I've learned from my mentors is that you always, always have three names in your back pocket for anything that goes down. Now you do have wish list, but then you also have a list of folks that you know you can get, right? So God forbid something happens, somebody gets a DUI, something bad happens, or you, you have a coach that walks away from the program, um, then like literally you go in your back pocket and you reach out and you start making phone calls. So if that's the case, then what what have why are we parading people in and out of South Bend, or why are we letting kind of this information get out? And all I can see is look at other institutions that are on that level that we're trying to get to, right? The Georgias, the Alabamas. I mean, again, I'm not that close to those programs, but you don't hear this stuff going on with them. Like you heard, and I was I was surprised, just like everybody else, Tommy Reese is be considered the offensive coordinator for Alabama. And I was like, wow, okay. But within what? I don't even think it was 48 hours. All of a sudden you saw an airplane and then all of a sudden he was announced. And so you look at the way that was done, and then you 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 look at the way it was done here, and now it's well, we tried to get people, so let's kind of go down the list and find somebody who will take the job. But then all of a sudden, hey guys, realize this is public. Like there's articles on Sports Illustrated, the the Athletic. I mean, all these kind of very popular publications that are saying, hey, you know what's going on in Notre Dame. So not only do we have to deal with issues of Tommy Reese being hired before Marcus Freeman, but now we have uh, uh, quarterback coaches being hired before offense coordinators. And then, and who I apparently Gino was Gino or Gino's guy's first, I don't even mess with the last name, but apparently yeah, Gino. Gino, well, I'm talking about Gino from, yeah, um, yeah right. Yeah, so yeah, and I only had a chance to read a couple articles about him, but apparently he's, he's a great dude. Right, so so now he's able to we're able to grab a court, uh, an offensive coordinator, which we should do because that's what we're in a position to do, because we are Notre Dame. We 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 should be able to go grab anybody we want to grab, regardless of price. But now we're we're learning that might not be the case. But it's just frustrating as a fan because we don't know, and as as an administrator, as an athletic director, all the things that are going on, you're probably sitting back in your seat laughing because. No one knows exactly what's going on outside of the people that are involved in the negotiations, right? And those uh, certain individuals who will re re remain nameless to the press, I mean, how much do they really know? How close to the program are they? And so, you know, we may not find out what actually happened maybe until next year, maybe a couple of years from now, but in the process, it just, it's just bad optics for Notre Dame trying to get to the top and really voicing what Tom Mendoza said, here's a guy who understands leadership, understands business. And as he mentioned, when you fail at something, you regroup, find out what the issue is, don't fail again, and, and, and be successful. Because at the end of the day, look, no one's perfect. However, when you have the light shined on you that the University of Notre Dame football program always does, you, you need to make sure what's going out there 
is something that you can control. And I think they got you know, they really got caught in a rough situation with, with, with this hire. Chris, so you mentioned if something are to, if something's to happen for any of those coaching positions, you you have to have names in your back pocket. It seemed like well, Jared well, Parker. Well, well, as an AD, but also as a head coach, right? right. So the head coach should have three names in the back pocket too. This guy right here, Jared Parker, is definitely a name in the back pocket. Someone with ex- yeah. there you go. The experience coaching uh, as an offensive coordinator, I think, is a little debatable because some people say, "Oh, well, he wasn't calling the plays at all this time, all, you know, for the whole time." But then he was a little bit of the part of the season. I, I don't know, but uh, at least for the twenty twenty or uh, two seasons, twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, he was the offensive coordinator and wide receivers coach at West Virginia. Um, yeah, I, like I said with. Tim, before we brought you on, Chris was hey, so many throw on the hot boards. You you mentioned him as a candidate, but he's not the first choice. But um, Jared Parker, Notre Dame's new offensive coordinator. I don't know if you are too familiar with Jared, or, or do you have any thoughts on this, Chris? Whether it's um, specifically Jared or the continuity of hiring from within, like how important is that? Well, I think we mentioned you know you know his his name is on the list. You know him. I believe Marcus had a relationship with him for a long time. Coach with him at Purdue. Yeah. So the idea is now, you know, if I couldn't get my first choices, I'm going with somebody safe, right? Now, I feel bad for Parker because, you know, now everybody's – the first question when when he's at his press conference is, hey, how do you feel about being the third, the third or fourth guy? Hey, he's waving around his raise he just got. That's what yeah, he yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Or all you got to do is just show the picture you showed before and say, hey, look, I knew where I was at. So you got – who's the next OC at Notre Dame? Make your choice here. But the idea of Marcus being able to find somebody that he can trust it's obviously important. Tim, and you know, you, you, you talked about this in the past. Yeah. When you talk about coaches and putting together a staff, you have to find people that you're able to trust. And in that regard, apparently Parker is, you know, 100% of what um, Marcus wanted. It's just frustrating that we had to see it as fans. We kind of had a chance to see the process out in public. And that's my concern is that, you know, when you talk about kind of the optics and the frustrating part about that is you see other programs who know how to do it. And then here we are, not sure, do we do the research? If we're bringing him, like like uh, Tom Mendoza said, as soon as his butt is on a plane, you know that this person is going to be in. You know that at that point, you're going to be able to announce him as, you know, the offensive coordinator of your, of your institution. And that didn't happen. Yeah. So comment. That, I mean, ahead, let me ask you a quick question. So is that, is that part of this learning curve we've heard been hearing about for the last 13, 14 months with Marcus Freeman, right? It's the first time he's ever had to do this, Chris. He's never well, had to go out and hire a head coach of the offense because Reese was pretty much there for him. So this is right. the first time he's had to do that. And I think, I think he had a list, like, like you said, he brought in Colin Klein, who he doesn't know, that brought in Andy Ludwig. Was he, obviously, Ludwig's a heck of a coach, and was he branching out? Supposedly, there, you know, there's uh, articles out there, he, he did like 12, 13 Zoom calls with coaches, mm-hmm. so he's obviously reaching out for the first time, trying to build the network, because his network is really small. Right, right, right. It, it, and that's what happens when you're when you're when you're the head coach for the first time, right? Yep. But the thing that we've learned when he had that chance to maybe hire his own OC, that wasn't in his favor at the time when he was given the position as a head coach. So now he has his chance. I'm sure he doesn't want to blow it, and so he has a he has his list, right? And I'm not sure how that process goes. But again, when you look at kind of the, on the administration side, I mean, all these phone calls, all these conversations need to happen outside of the eyes of the media, which they obviously did. But again, those are conversations of, you know, hey, how sure are you, are you coming? What are the hangups? What do we need to do to make this right? And again, if we're looking for, if we're looking for examples, we see Tommy Reese board a jet and he doesn't come back. But yet when we see when we're trying to do it, guy gets on a jet, goes to a hockey game, but then he goes back home. Yeah, that's the killer. As you know, I mean, 
you just interviewed the guy. Obviously, you want him. You've talked about all those things. All right, go home, hang out with the family, enjoy Super Bowl. Tell us what you think in two days. It's like, whoa. No, no, you know, I mean, that, that's not part, you know, I mean, part of, and I said before that, you know, I work for an executive search firm and we know when we're putting clients, excuse me, when we're putting candidates in front of our clients, we have to know everything. You know, we know how old the kids are. We know what school the kids go to. We know uh, who, who their, their nannies are possibly, but Blood in tight. this case, Got it all. If, yeah, I mean, if, if it helps, if it helps. <laughs> You know, if, if you're doing the search for, you know, the, the uh, a blood bank, yeah. But the idea is that you need to know everything before the, you, that person gets on the plane. And that's why I kind of, you know, I know Tom's getting a lot of crap. I'm a huge Tom Mendoza fan. He's getting a lot of crap for what he, what, what he said. One, he's very passionate, probably. He's been on my podcast. Probably the most passionate alum I've ever talked to. Knows more about Notre Dame football than I do. And... I think what he said was was a hundred percent right. When you make a mistake, let's learn from it. And as he said, markets can move on, but have we truly learned? And, and that's really kind of what I'm hoping we had a chance to kind of learn from this process is how to to, to do things the right way. Yeah, um, we had uh, yeah the, the the super chat that I had up on the screen for a little while saying, hey, uh, what what's next? I mean, Parker is next. Uh, Gino, oh man, Gaduli, keep struggling with that one. Gino, Gaduli, Gaduli, there you go. by the uh, the end of the show, um, and and we also had a, a super chat here. Um, does Parker have a relationship with Hartman or Carr? Uh, I mean, uh, appreciate it, Andrew. He, he, I know he's been communicating with Carr more recently. Carr's right. twenty twenty four quarterback commit for the Irish, um, and yeah, I mean. He's Carr's obviously been to Notre Dame like a dozen times. They he's ran into Parker many times. I think he's um I don't think there's any reason to be concerned about Carr. And then Hartman, I mean, I don't know how well he knows him. They just met a, a couple weeks ago, I'm sure. So um yeah, but all all should be uh well there. Sean, appreciate the uh the, the two bucks on the super chat. But yeah, let's move into Gino. I think that um Coach Gaduli. Gaduli, Gaduli, Gaduli. There you, go. Go. you got this. All right. Man, when you put all of this aside, all of this hoopla, this looks like a pretty good hire. I mean, he's got Absolutely. great hair, which I like in a coach, right? <laughs> Even though he's, it's, I mean, he's 39, um, so he's still a pretty young guy. But I do like that he's got gray hair. I like how my coaches have gray hair. Um, he played quarterback. Um, big, I mean, 78 touchdowns at, at Cincinnati, over 11,000 passing yards. Um, spent a year um, in the NFL, played in the CFL, the AFL. Um, and then, yeah, he's got a, a pretty strong resume. He's coached running backs, been a recruiting coordinator, obviously offensive coordinator. Um, you know, he did that at Central Michigan in 2017 and then for Cincinnati just this past season. Um, he's coached running backs. Interestingly enough, Jared Parker was going to be Cincinnati's running backs coach in 2017. He was hired for that. Circumstances led him to Duke. And then they bring in Gino Gadulli um, to coach the same position. Oh, so the guy is – I mean, the I, I'm I'm interested in your your thoughts on this, Chris. I said this in a video today. Guys like Andy Ludwig and and we we all love Harry Heastand, but I mean those guys don't want to be on the road recruiting. Like they're you know they're not those you know I want to go out on the trail and absolutely crush it. I mean they, that's just not their thing. But guys like Parker and Gaduli, they fit more of the Notre Dame. What, what Marcus Freeman wants in a Notre Dame coach. These, And I don't think the age matters, but the younger you are, the typically the more energy you have, right, to go deal with these you know, 17, 18-year-old kids. They're going to go out and go get the Jimmies and Joes. I think that's something when you look at these two hires, I think that's something to be excited about. You, you don't have that experience with a guy like Andy Ludwig, but this little – I mean, they're not co-OCs, but it does look like Parker and Gaduli are the – you know, the face moving yeah. forward for the Notre Dame offense. Like, I think they're going to crush it on the recruiting trail. What, what do you think about that, Ted, Chris? Well, I think anytime Marcus Freeman is in the, the head seat as the head coach, you're you're going to have to recruit your ass off. And I think he's, he's the perfect example of if my head coach is out there doing it, then I obviously have to get my ass out there and do it too. So your, your comments about Harry, I don't know his recruiting style. I don't know what was going on. But the idea that we know that Marcus is a an exceptional recruiter, literally sleeping two, three hours a night, 
Um, and he demands that from his staff. And so one, he obviously has Parker on staff already. He's known uh, uh, Gino for a long time. The idea that, again, he feels comfortable with these hires, I think that's what we can take away from this, that at the end of the day, however it shook out, that Marcus has people that he can trust. And that's 99% of the battle, right? Because I mean, when, when you have somebody, when you bring somebody in new, I mean, there's a culture issue. There's all these things that may have some bearing out what happens. But at the end of the day, you want to get people in there that you can trust. And we can at least check off that box and know that, that, that Marcus has trust in these guys. And if you spent time with Gino, I believe it was at, was it at Cincinnati? So he spent time with, and, and the, Gino knows how much of a, of a voracious recruiter that Marcus is. I'm sure he's going to be pumped up and excited. And one of the downfalls that we heard, again, I don't know this personally, that we heard about Tommy Reese was that he wasn't as adept at recruiting as other folks were, and obviously, especially Marcus. And so now you look at it and say, well, now Marcus has folks that are going to be out there on the recruiting trail as much as he is. So that, in a sense, is extremely important. Right, well, one more thing, I'll throw it over to Tim, uh, Pete Sampson, who we respect the heck out of. Um, you know, Pete's over at the. Yeah, do we really? Do we? Yeah, I'm kidding. Uh, he tweeted, uh, you know, he tweeted, he could confirm the report. He said, Marcus Stream is looking inward with hires who align philosophically with his approach. I think that's uh, backs up what you were just saying. And sure. um, he also tweeted, um, you know, this out. Um, it was an interview that he had with Clark Lee um, and, and tweets that thinking about the combo hires of Parker and, and Gaduli, something Clark Lee told me about your hiring your first staff resonates. Um, and he said, uh, initially I felt if you find, if you found qualified people, you could kind of plug them in and things run the same or, or things run the way that you intend for them to run. But this is what Clark Lee learned. Um, he was trying, all right. He says, what I learned was way more effort has to be put into the chemistry um, around what you're trying to get done. The chemistry on the staff bleeds into the chemistry on the team. So this is something I talk about a lot is that these are real people, like just because they have um, a lot more money in their bank account doesn't mean they don't have real world problems. Like if I, you know, like me and Tim might not get along all the time. Um, just like Jared Parker and, you know, uh, Dylan McCullough, if you're just throwing out random names. They, like these are real people who have, like can have real problems with each other if their chemistry is not there. So this is not like a game of Madden where if you just have all 99 overall <laughs> players, you're going to win. Like, right. um, you know, that might not happen because you have egos, you have real people, real sure. emotions in this. So I think that there's something to that. Marcus Freeman going with what he knows, um, you know, he's gone outside of his little, you know, um, you know, coaching tree under Fickle, right? I mean, sure. he's going after Dylan McCullough, mm -hmm. uh, Chancey Stuckey, even Harry Heastan. So it's not like he's just hiring from, you know, the Fickle tree, Um but yeah, it, there is something to be said about going with that chemistry, which is also a reason why Freeman got eventually hired. Or, or, well, you know, and, and then just one thing, I know Tim, if you mind, let me jump in for like, I promise, 30 seconds, um, which just goes to show you the more respect that we should all have for Nick Saban. And I know folks hate it. I'm a huge Nick Saban advocate. I think he's an incredible coach. From, from what you just talked about with uh, Coach Leah, now you're talking about an individual like um, Nick Saban who gets his staff poached every year. And somehow, somehow, the, the chemistry's there, the culture's there, and they're always winning. So that just goes to show you what they do at Alabama and what we need to kind of learn from that at other schools. Tim? Yeah, just real quick on Gino is, you know, it's just a little background with him is, I mean, look at his quarterback at Cincinnati, Desmond Ritter, had him the entire time. Took Cincinnati. I mean, he, you know, he was at, obviously, Cincinnati built that with Luke Fickle. And um, look what he, look what Ritter did to in Notre Dame Stadium, threw for 300 yards. And here's a group of five team beats Notre Dame in a top 10 matchup. So, 
you know, the Ritter thing, people are like, oh, he had a horrible year last year at Cincinnati. Yeah, Cincinnati had, what, almost as many guys as Alabama got drafted. So they had a boatload of guys go to the NFL. Cincinnati was down last year, new quarterback, new all that stuff. So the fact that he has a year of experience as an OC, but that year is basically coaching brand new guys after Ritter and that whole group that went to the playoffs left. So, and you, and you mentioned uh, Luke Fickle, the tree. Well, that was those, well, those trees, those branches on that Luke, Fick, uh, Luke Fickle tree is Urban Meyer. So you got a lot of Urban Meyer in this coming through these guys, which starts with Marcus Freeman. And real quick on, you got me fired up real quick, for, uh, Chris, talking about culture and chemistry. You know, people are like, oh, Parker's on staff. What does he know? Well, who in the world was your defensive coordinator when you won a national championship? It was some guy who no one knew about on campus, but he knew the culture. He knew the chemistry. He knew what to talk when Lou Holtz left the room. And it was a guy named Barry Alvarez who had no D.C. coordinating experience. Barry Alvarez in College Football Hall of Fame. So you want to talk about Barry and Hint coming, you know, kind of like, I mean, it's not, he's not Jerry Parker, but it's the same thing. Same with Clark Lee. Clark Lee had zero DC experience and look at Clark Lee. So, but just talk about Barry. I just thought about that real quick when you brought up culture and, uh, and, you know, obviously philosophy and chemistry with the coaching staff. Well, and as an aside to your story, Tim, I had Barry on my podcast and he talked about how, after he won the national championship, he had some opportunities to become a head coach. But he didn't want to because he felt he wasn't ready. But he went into Lou's office and said, you know, hey, I want to be a head coach. I've had some opportunities. I turned them down. As you know, can you teach me how to be a head coach? Can you bring me in on some of the meetings? So then that next year, Lou brings Barry into a bunch of meetings. I mean, he, he goes over and literally he is a head coach in training. Should have been Notre Dame, but that's a whole different story. And then the next year, boom, he goes to Wisconsin. And I believe they have two statues of him somewhere around the campus. I mean, one as a coach and then the other as the AD. Like, I mean, so, Tim, you are 100% right. When done properly, you it's just a great situation. Yes. I love it. All right. Um I think we had anything else for you, Tim. Oh, we actually, or, or uh, Tim, Chris, uh, we, we do have a couple super chats. Sean dropped the two and he said, I bought a super chat and it took me out. Thought on thoughts on Jack Swarbrick. I think he's part of the problem. Uh, Chris, do you have 30 seconds, a true 30 seconds on this and not a 10 30 seconds? <laughs> so, as a former disciple of Jack, Jack Swarbrick, I had a chance to work for him for a couple years. I mean, I, he's one of the smartest guys in athletics, right? In inclusion athletics. That's why I'm just kind of amazed at kind of how this process happened. I mean, you you look at what he's been able to accomplish as the athletic director at Notre Dame since he's gotten there, where there's some 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 mishaps, yeah. But the idea that he not only knows what he's doing, he's able to kind of set trends and everything else. So I'm kind of surprised that something like this happened under his watch. All right. Yeah, that is a true 30. Uh, yeah, Derek says, appreciate you guys, Josh Schwarberg. Starting to remind me of Mark Davis of the Raiders. Uh, mm-hmm. Derek, uh, appreciate the five. Um, all right. Chris, before we get you out of here, I know you had something you wanted to tell us about that was pretty unique. Yes, it's kind of something very exciting. And in honor of me being on here with you guys, uh, I've decided to give a kind of a, a promo code for our Airbnb that we have in South Bend for the spring game. So we, we decided to kind of open this up and the, the individual that's going to rent it for the spring game weekend is going to get the same treatment that we give them during the season, which is an hour with me hanging out in the Airbnb, uh, kind of giving them a tour, showing them the photos, uh, kind of getting some great stories about Coach Holtz and our trek to the national championship. Um, they get a helmet. They get a couple of jerseys. They get signed football. They get a whole bunch of swag if they have a chance to kind of stay there. So we we actually created a promo code, which is a hundred dollars off to anybody who rents it in the next forty eight hours from watching this podcast. I think it'd be a great opportunity, and I would love. Oh, there's a picture of me, kind of, and all the stuff on tables. What you'll get, you know, which is really cool. Um, what you don't see 
and we kind of added this. And actually, Renzi has a book uh, on the table, which is actually pretty cool. But what you don't see is the actual Guinness glasses that were, oh, no, there they go right there. But this time, we actually have Guinness that actually goes inside them. So they're, it's, it's really cool to enjoy. Dude, that's awesome. So the miniclover.com backslash 2023 spring sp- spring game. And yep. you and you get to hang out with Chris Zorich. Hey, hey, I'm telling you, I mean, this is, it, it, it's, it's a great experience. We had a chance to, to have, we were booked last year. Folks had a blast. Uh, we've gotten rave reviews. Really, and, and what we try to do is kind of give them the experience of being a national champion. Um, the photos that are on the wall are like Lou Holtz, Tony Rice, Rocket. I mean, some, some great stories there about kind of our trek to the national championship. And one of the things that I love about the, the tour, in one of the rooms, we have a poster. Oh, yep, there it is right there. So look at that. I, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that poster right there, you might not be able to tell, but that's actually Pat Terrell's play against Miami. And so what you'll see is it's actually drawn out. And it's so funny because when Pat signs autographs now, people ask him to draw out the play. And he's like, the whole play, really? But anyway, so he, he and, and we kind of talk about kind of what happened in that situation. And Pat will love me for this. What folks don't remember about that game was Pat actually had a pick six, which um, a lot of folks don't know. But if you have a chance to come there, it's a great experience. Uh, we obviously are excited about bringing this experience to the fans of Notre Dame. And so we decided when you called me, I wanted to kind of hook up your listeners and viewers with the opportunity to, to stay at the mini clover for the spring game. Rick says it's, it's forward slash. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The, the mini, no, I said backslash. Okay. I don't know. I always say backslash forward slash the mini clover.com forward slash 2023 spring game. And yeah, you, you, you get a little deal and you get to again, this is this is the best part. You get to hang out with Chris Zorich. Get to ask him all your questions. <laughs> and um, what you're seeing there is is a local South Bend um, reporter named Allison Hayes, yeah. and she's awesome. But thank thank God you can fast forward a little bit. Well, there's my wife, but you can fast forward a little bit. We actually played a game of corn. Oh, here it is. There it is. Watch yeah, this. Wait, wait, watch this. First time it goes in. We're like, what the hell? Dude, she like she like did really? a, a mic drop. Yeah, she was done. She's like, you know what? I got you. I got you. So that's her kind of bragging about it. But uh, no, it, it, it's a great time. Joy, fire pit and everything. We really were excited to really kind of open this opportunity up for, our, for the spring game. All right. Let's go stay there. Great place. You get a little deal. The miniclover.com forward slash 2023 spring game. Uh, and support, you your bucks Notre, off. support your favorite Notre Dame player, Chris Zorch. Chris? Appreciate your time in the show. I think this is probably your third or fourth time uh, here at Blue and Gold uh, on our YouTube channel. And we always appreciate it, my friend. Well, what folks might not know, I have a crazy history with Blue and Gold because as a kid, oh yeah, when I was being recruited by Notre Dame, one of the things that I'm pretty sure this was legal by the NCAA at the time, but when you signed your letter of intent, you got a four-year subscription to Blue and Gold Illustrated. Oh my gosh. So as a friend, so this is how crazy it is, right? And you talk to Pat, you ever get Pat on, they'll tell you these stories. So we used to kind of go through those like, oh, Leo, who are the kids coming in? Because there was no, you know, recruiting service or anything like that. So, you know, you, you really didn't know anybody until you got the magazine in the mail. Then you kind of start looking at your competition, see who's who, who and it's like, okay, all right, I, I can beat this guy. Man, I don't think I can beat that guy. So, but Pat Terrell has some crazy stories about that. And now in today's age, you have guys like Mike Singer who write daily articles. <laughs> there you go. Three or four articles a day on recruiting. Wow, how things have changed. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's pretty crazy. But, yeah, Chris, we'll have to have you on again soon, my friend. You got it. Thank you much, guys. Team was awesome. Right, Chris. What a legend. Um, yeah, thoughts on our, our time with uh, Chris Orch? you learn anything new, Tim? Oh, no, it's just always great to listen to him talk. And, you know, and people probably don't realize he worked with he worked at Notre Dame. He worked in the athletic department with Swarbuck when uh, when he took over. So he's got he's got some insight. He's obviously been an athletic director in college as well. So it was good. It was great to get some opinions. And I love that, you know, him and I'm sure he's talked to all his guys that played, you know, during those years with Holtz and they're all scratching their head. Like, what the heck happened here? Like, it's the same thing. I know when, when that picture came out and he's at the hockey game, 
It's like, all right, they're getting Andy Luck, but this is awesome. I think he's the Eagle football coach. He's, I mean, Utah football is really good. And I, I had spent all last week watching film late at night, prepping, watching a bunch of his games last few years. Even went back and watched the 2018 Vanderbilt Notre Dame game to watch his offense. To just start getting a feel because. I fully expected you and I were going to get on here and talk about Andy Ludwig and the Notre Dame offense. So I was excited, but I got nervous and kind of like what Chris says, but when he gets back on, on the plane and it's like, all right, we'll talk about this later. You let a guy have the opportunity to change his mind. It does seem more like reports are coming out that it was cold feet yeah. and that's what it was. And he just wanted to, you know, he's from Utah but and I can't help but think oh, it's, it's it's everything. Listen, it's, but I can't help but think, man, is that is that Notre Dame trying to cover their butts? But Tim, you have to remember this. I think it was Sunday. I posted on our message board or Saturday, even I post on the message board. He has a two point eight million dollar buyout. I put that on the board because I yep. talked to somebody in Utah um, about the buyout, and I was told that Notre Dame was going to pay it. So then you hear, oh, the buyout. That's the thing. That's what Pete did. I'm like, well, sh- well crap. I, I guess my, you know, I kind of put out some wrong info, but now it's coming back that I was right. On. So I'm just like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how you can point to one thing and be like, oh, that's what it is. And it's just, you know, Swarbrick really screwed up. And regardless, either way, he, th- th- you know, they probably messed up somewhere, but it's just, man, um, just a really weird situation. But hey, Notre Dame has who they have. Jared Parker. Gino Gadouli, that's what Notre Dame's moving forward to. We haven't even talked about the offensive line opening, which is what we will um, go to next. Of course, uh, we will hear from the Rogue Shop first. It's everyone's favorite, um, you know, favorite shop. So, folks, it's a husband and wife outfit. Mr. Rogue and his wife, Shar, are craft cannabis farmers who specialize in small batch sustainable plant medicine a true holistic type of small business. They farm and grow everything themselves and do everything by hand. We really need to get Tim with these beautiful earrings right here. I think Tim needs to wear them for our next show. Uh, but seriously, do everything by hand. Their visit to um, their website to visit is rogueshop.com, R O G U E shop.com. They sell everything, folks CBD, THC, edibles, tinctures, smokables, bath salts pain creams, topicals, vapes, candles, soaps, and more. Their website uh, has a 24-7 uh, chat fun- chat function uh, where customers can ask the owners of the shop any questions they have. Go check it out. It's rogueshop.com. If you have issues sleeping, you have chronic pain, anxiety, or stress, and you can use promo code blue and gold uh, for 10% of your order. Um, that is promo code blue and and gold, all one word. It's Indiana's place for legal CBD, THC, and more. Please, go, please do uh, check that out if you are interested. And and hit the thumbs up on this video. Help support what we're doing here at Blue and Gold. So, um, yeah, Tim, we got about ten minutes left in the show. Let's t- let's talk about Harry He Stand. And when he announced he was retiring, first the timing was not ideal for for us folks who are in the Notre Dame media and just wanted to watch the Super Bowl peacefully. Um, but that aside, it was kind of like, you know, is he retiring? Cause he doesn't want to have a new boss just, and now it's like, well, he, he would have had a new boss in, in Parker, but I think it probably life would have been the same for him if he would have stayed, but Hey, nonetheless, Harry, he stands retired. Just your reaction on that. Like how big of an impact do you think that's going to be? Oh, it'll be a big one just because he's a hell of a football coach. He's a great offensive line coach, you know, and obviously his name speaks for himself. So, you know, that's, you know, there's no doubt about that. So, I mean, especially in recruiting, guys get excited when he offer, you know, they offer him and they come visit and they meet him. They talk football. You just listen to all the 2023 kids that signed with him and the early 24 kids that he's met have loved spending time with him talking football. So, no, it's it's a big loss because obviously – Notre Dame, Tommy Reese in particular, went out and brought him back to uh, establish the, the Notre Dame O-line from what he did it during his first reign. So, But at the same time, he I mean, he was retired for two years. So he had a golden opportunity. Tommy Reese brought him back, you know, convinced him to leave retirement, come out, coach football, obviously with the great offensive linemen that they have. Did a heck of a job last year. The first opportunity he had to leave, he took it. I mean, that's... 
that's really the, the way I look at it is he went back to retirement. The guy's in his mid sixties. So he's a, he's a heck of a football coach. He's going to be missed, but um, you know, it sounds like Marcus Freeman made a big push to keep him, try and convince him to stay. And he's like, Hey, I came back for Tommy. Tommy wanted me to coach. I, I did my job. Tommy's gone. Time to move on. So cheers for him. And now let's go get an offensive lineman because there's a lot of offense with 17, 18 scholarship linemen to choose from and start building some depth. So really excited to see who they're going to get because this is a stacked offensive line room. So 2021, you have Jeff Gwynn as the offensive line coach, or I mean, or it was Harry Heastand and, and Chris Watt coaching on that a backyard yeah. barbecue, you know, it depends yeah. on who you ask. Um, but in all seriousness, um, yeah, Jeff Quinn coached the offensive line in 2021. Um, obviously Harry in 2022. Now you bring in a new offensive line coach in 2023. Even if it's an internal guy who uh, we'll talk about that next Tim. how much does that cohesion hurt Notre Dame? Because I mean, offensive line coach has to be up there for most important roles in a football program. You're an offensive line guy. How much is this sting for Notre Dame? Just from that aspect, like put aside that Harry he stands one of the goats in offensive line coaching, just that aspect of continuity. How much does that hurt for that position specifically? Oh, it's, I mean, it's going to take, a, it's going to take a bite, you know, um, cause he did work with Parker. Now that Parker's got promoted, obviously he worked with him. He's a tight end coach. So they work side by side. There's drills and videos of them working together in August during the August camp during all the videos. So, yeah, I'm sure Harry would have loved to work with Parker and whatnot. So, but at the same time, it's, he's only there for one year. So it's not like his tentacles are deep. You know, he's, he'd been gone. He's with the bears and two full years of retirement. So he had a coach at Notre Dame since 17. These guys all know him by name, Quentin Nelson and all the other guys that coached, you know, that these guys all know with Zach Martin and all of them. So, you know, it's probably good for Marcus Freeman. Like, Hey, he did his one year. He established that culture again and whatnot. Boom, just go out and just get another guy that's going to be here with Freeman during probably a long period of time if Freeman stays at Notre Dame. I think that's the biggie, uh, you know, that he is gone after one year. So I don't I don't think that's going to hurt Notre Dame. Do you find it interesting that the day after he stand re- announced his retirement, Notre Dame sends out two offers, Andrew Sprague and Br- Brandon Baker, I believe his name is. Do you find that interesting? Because I had been told, yeah. and I, th- I think I talked about this with Goolsby, Monday night in our show, I used the word stingy, and he said um, I wasn't specific. It was some kind of where, like, you know, he was very intentional about his offers. Didn't send out too many, sure. but you know, he stand didn't want to offer Andrew Sprague and Brandon Baker. And then the first thing Notre Dame was going to have an offensive line coach or offensive coordinator. What do they do? Say we cannot have another day where we have not offered those two guys. Um, did you have any reaction to that, Tim? Well, number one, I love those guys. I love Sprague. He's one of my favorite guys. He's a he's huge. He looks like Mike McGlinchey. He's he's massive. So he's definitely one of my favorite offensive linemen. And, and I, I think I even posted on an article you did a few months ago, like, hey, any word on Andrew Sprague? And you're like, nothing yet. So they, he's yeah, they just been to his high school a bunch. That's yeah, exactly. I mean, he's been one of my favorite uh, football players out there, and uh, and Baker's a stud. I mean, modern day high school's legit. I mean, the best of the best in the country. So, yeah, Harry, Harry was picky. You know, I see some people commenting in the message board, you know, the the chat room here, like, oh, Harry only recruited three stars during Harry Heastan's first reign. Seventeen out of his eighteen commits were blue chips. We're all four stars and five stars with Quentin Nelson. So. He didn't just go out and get a bunch of th- three stars. Only, only two, only one three star started multiple seasons for him, and that was Nick Martin. So he had elite offensive linemen playing for him. So I don't, I don't buy that. Uh, you know, he was lazy. He went and got guys. He was lazy in that he didn't offer seventy five linemen. He just it's not he, lazy. No, he was Quinn, Quinn didn't offer that many. I mean, he offered more than no, Harry, but not a ton. No, it, it's a it's a narrative that's out there, and obviously people believe it and they stick to it you don't get lazy they out recruited michigan for charles jagasaw they got sullivan absher and uh pendleton away from clemson so from the two guys out of the south so how lazy is he um he was on the road every time he was on the uh, chance to go on the road he was on there he was always in your lucky charms and your articles so he stands out there visiting everyone all the time i mean his first day after he got hired the first opportunity he had to go on the road on a monday he went and visited charles in Illinois. So he, he was out there. That's just a crazy narrative that people like to stick to. But um, 
no, I'm I'm excited for him. Enjoy retirement. He's a heck of a football coach. I was bummed because I was obviously excited to see him coach this group, especially the guards. Who in the heck is going to play the guards next year? It's like flip a coin. But, uh, you know, really wanted him to go out with a couple All-American tackles under his wing with Alton Fisher. Well, he got Alt. He was All-American this year, so not a bad way to leave. So if Notre Dame does go and get, um, I guess, just go down the hall and get uh, Chris Watt, let's just say, you know, I have to believe that they're exploring different options, but I think it would from an, from an and Notre Dame fans will tell us in the chat that Parker Gadouli and Watt would not inspire them. They want to go get, um, you know, Tom Herman or um, Urban Meyer as offensive coordinator and, 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 you know, yeah, the Eagles offensive line. Coach, yeah. Right? Just, you know, Andy Heck. Andy Heck, get Andy Heck from the Chiefs. Yeah, he's only been there what fifteen years. So yeah, let's get. So, it. I, I I understand that, but I guess in Freeman we trust. What and I'm hearing that Chris Watt um, is being seriously considered for the job. It did look like if it was going to be Ludwig, that Ludwig was going to bring his offensive line coach from Utah, which good ball coach. Yeah, and I had been hearing and and several others as well that it, the offensive line coach at Utah probably would have been promoted to OC, but it looks like that was not Notre Dame's plan. They wanted to get them both. But if it is Watt, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think it's too soon for Watt to be Notre Dame's offensive line coach? Because it's kind of like, I I hope, I I don't mean for this to be disrespectful, but it's like a 16-year-old just getting his his driver's permit, you know, his driver's license in Ferrari. You know, like, seriously. um, You know, what, what would you think about this, Tim? You know, the first, you know, I mean, he hired O'Leary. That was, you know, when I've heard this Watt thing, I was like, well, you know what? You know, his first, his first hire at Notre Dame was O'Leary, who was a graduate, who was a GA. Had less experience, really. Freeman less loved, president. Exactly. Yeah. Freeman loved working with him. And all of a sudden, he interviews him. And he's like, I'm going to get, you know, I want this guy to be my safeties coach. He gets hired as head coach. And he keeps O'Leary. He, you know, his buddy Mickens from high school and whatnot. So, you know, he keeps those, those those guys that are close to him and what is interesting. Cause I'm the same thing. Like, Oh man, there's some great offensive line coaches out there. A couple of guys that he's obviously worked with that could come here at Notre Dame and have a great career and whatnot. But then you're like, all right, well, you know, Chris Watt was a heck of an offensive lineman for Notre Dame. Coach, you know, obviously coach is coached with here, Harry, he you know, was, you know, a GA at Notre Dame, you know, with obviously Quinn and still had those ties with Harry, you know, was at Tulane last year, got let go, comes right back to Notre Dame. Do you hire the Notre Dame guy who's been trained, played, you know, four years for Harry, knows that older Notre Dame offensive line? That, that's, that's, man, if he does it, it's like, it's interesting because, you know, O line guys, I'm like, go find Joe Moore, go find that old crusty guy. That's what Lou Holtz did in 88. Went and found the old, you know, angry man to go coach up his guys. That's kind of what Harry did for Notre Dame all these years. So is Chris going to be that guy? Is he going to be that, that next wave of Joe Moore, Harry, he stand, you know, disciple, so to speak. So if he picks him, I'm excited as heck. Cause you know, it's going back to your point, Mike, you know, he's going to work his tail off. Yeah. You know he's going to work. Right off. I, I, I want to clear something up. Like I think, I think a lot of just in the scene, the message board fodder and we'll last topic for this um, is, Oh, Freeman is just kind of just like what we saw in Brian Kelly, just hiring your buddies. I think it's different than that. Like, I think Brian Kelly made the comfortable hires. Um, but I think Freeman, it's it's not about comfortable, it's about the chemistry. chemistry. It is, it, it is. I I really, especially for the young coach, he you know, I don't think he wants to, you know, step out too much. And whether that's a good idea or not. I think we'll find out this season. I do. Because when I've talked to people, they think, like, you know, we're talking good sources here. They think that this is the big year for Notre Dame. Now, when I'll, you know, talking to these people, this is before all this these coaching moves. Now, how much, you know, uh, is there a fall off, you know, an offensive coordinator? I mean, people in the building respect the heck out of Jared Parker. So, I mean, we'll – all that remains to be seen. I just can't poo-poo too much when I haven't seen the guy call a game at Notre Dame, Jared Parker. I agree. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's chemistry over comfort. 
I don't know. Maybe I'm naive on that. What do you think, Tim? Well, that goes back to you, Barry Alvarez when he got hired. The same thing with Lou Holtz. Right, that's it's funny. This that's funny. I'm excited true. for that chemistry and the beef over him. That's what I'm saying. Like we will, we will. See. Yeah, we'll find out. I mean, that's why you play the games. But uh, yeah, chemistry. That's that was a big Brian Kelly thing with hiring Clark Lee. Mike Elko was one of the best D coordinators in the country at Wake Forest. You know, everyone knew Mike Elko, and. Clark Lee is a guy who, you know, just been a ball coach. And he just said, you know what? They had that 2017 after the horrendous 2016, the meltdown, the chemistry, the backstabbing that went on on that football team. Kelly's like, I don't want to do it again. And he interviewed dudes and he stuck with Clark Lee. He's like, I'm going to give you a shot. And now Clark Lee's a head football coach in the SEC. So, you know, same thing with Tommy Reese. Tommy Reese is now an offensive coordinator in the SEC. Mike Elko's doing fine. Mike Elko is doing fine. The Duke head coach. So. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes, especially a young coach, Marcus Freeman's never done this before. So he's probably like, man, I just lost four games. I'm going to rally a bunch of dudes around me that I know, that I trust. And we're going to do this thing my way. We're going to go crazy. We're going to recruit our tails off. I want a bunch of guys are going to work 18 hour days, get a little bit of sleep, drink some coffee, keep working. And maybe that's what's going to happen with Notre Dame in a few years. Tim, I'm like, what let's happened? think about in my job, right? And in, in my field of journalism. Do I want to hire people who I know I can go to to war with, or do I want to go hire some, you know, some schmuck over there who's got some pretty good experience? But I don't know him, you know. Like I think it's I think we can all think about that in our positions. I think we're we are kind of you know looking at this from a, a pretty optimistic view. Um, seven and five. Someone says seven and five. No, come on, it's it's be all right, Tim. You got a, uh, you got a, uh, you know, thirty seconds, and we're signing off. How old are you doing twenty twenty three, Tim? I, I, I'm gonna crazy. stick to my thing. It's all, hey, it's all about Ohio State. Let's just get to Ohio State. If Notre Dame's not four zero, then they have bigger issues than we're talking about going into that game. The whole, the whole season is Ohio State. That's the Super Bowl. If you don't beat Ohio State, the narrative continues. You can't handle these guys. So that is the game. You win that game. I said it all along. If you beat Ohio State, you're going 11 and one minimum. You're, you're going to the playoffs. If you lose that, nine and three, get ready for the beef of Brady Bowl, as someone just said. So there you go. It's Ohio State. The entire season's Ohio State. It's at home, at night. It's Ohio State. All right, Andy fan, really appreciate the two bucks. Hope we uh, see you in a show. Yeah, we'll have. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a YouTube video. Some some stuff tomorrow. We'll have Friday. Uh, recruiting show, uh, Trey Yannity's back. So we'll have um, the return of our Friday afternoon recruiting show. Um, and yeah, we'll have more reaction. Goolsby show we will not have this upcoming week. If you're listening to this via podcast and you're wondering where the Goolsby show was and we didn't put it online, it's because we talked about so much about Andy Ludwig and then an hour afterwards the show <laughs> ended. News broke that Ludwig was not going to Notre Dame. So I just like, I don't want to put this outdated stuff on podcasts. But um, yeah, obviously you're listening to this one on podcasts. Plenty of good stuff here from Tim Hyde, Chris Zorich. Uh, please do go check out that website from Zorich, uh, the mini clover.com. Um, backs, was it forward slash backslash? I don't remember. 2023 spring game. Um, and then yeah, rogueshop.com, Augie's locker room. Thank you to our spons- sponsors there. Uh, Nathan uh, dropping a last minute, su- last second super chat. Tim, why do you keep bringing up Marcus Freeman's inexperience? The Ludwig debacle has nothing to do with Marcus Freeman. Give me a true thirty on this, Tim. Yeah, well, well, Nathan. The, I mean, the inexperience is yeah, he's he's never been in this situation, so everything he's doing is new each and every day. Sure, the L- Ludwig thing has nothing to do with Marcus Freeman. He was ready to hire him. I was excited as high heck. Entire Notre Dame fan base is excited. He's a great offensive coordinator. Yeah, you're right. It has nothing to do with Freeman, but he is inexperienced. That's why he is hiring guys he knows. He's hiring guys he is coached with. He's not branching out. Look at all the hires that they've done. It's all somehow dudes that they have known or have sourced other guys that know them. So that's what he's done. Lud- Ludwood would have been the you know the different thing, and it didn't work out. Multiple reasons, and now he's going with guys he knows. Yeah, and again, like I said earlier in the show, like he's – He's gone outside of that fickle tree before. I mean, like he's done it with Stucky and, and McCullough and even even Harry. Um, so, I mean, he tried to do it here, but if that didn't work out, go to what do you know. But, all right, fantastic show. Banger of a show to return after taking last week off um, as I was, yeah, chopping wood and, and, and doing all that stuff in Colorado. Um, that sounded like it was something that it was not. I promise you I was not doing anything bad in Colorado. Uh, but seriously, next week, Tim – Think of some ideas. Let's bring on another uh, awesome guest. 
And uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Hit that thumbs up, folks. We will catch you next week.